In this video, I'm going to teach you how to name cycloalkanes that have branches or halogens or a combination of both. In this uh, video, I'm going to assume that you already have some practice naming straight chain alkanes with branches or halogens, and you have a general understanding of things like numbering the carbon chain and how to go about naming branches or substituents or halogens. When we are naming a cycloalkane with a branch or a substituent, we're still gonna follow the general rule of finding the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms in the molecule. And for cyclic molecules, that is generally going to be the cyclic portion of the molecule, the ring. So what I've done here is just identified these six carbons that are in the ring. It can be a little bit tricky when we're picking the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms in a cyclic molecule because technically we could just kind of go like this and that would be a pretty long continuous chain of carbon atoms. But the rules say that when we make this decision about finding the longest continuous chain of carbons, that longest continuous chain either needs to be a complete loop like this, so it meets back up in a ring, or it needs to be just a straight chain, just all by itself. So maybe it could be just this much of a straight chain. But it can't, our longest chain cannot come in and out of a ring. So it has to be just the six carbon atoms here of the ring. So this is a six carbon atom cyclic molecule. We would call this cyclohexane. Um, now we're actually gonna, um, number the carbon chain the way that we normally would, starting at the end that's closest to our, our branch or our substituent. This is our branch right here. Because this is a ring, we don't have an end, like there isn't an end or a beginning. So when we number this particular molecule, we're just gonna start numbering with the carbon that actually holds the substituent. And then we're gonna continue numbering either clockwise or counterclockwise. If there are no other substituents on the molecule, then we could number either direction we want, clockwise or counterclockwise. But we'll look at some examples where we have to make a choice about clockwise or counterclockwise. So this molecule has one substituent. That substituent is on carbon number one. And the name of this, its location is one. And the name of this, because it's a two carbon substituent, is ethyl. So this is an ethyl on carbon number one. Now, if we're putting this name together, just like normal, we would put the location and the name of the substituent right up front, one ethyl, and then we would follow that by the name of the, the longest chain of carbon atoms, cyclohexane. So one thing that is um, kind of frustrating about naming cycloalkanes, and this is, like I said, this is kind of a frustrating rule, if there's only one thing on the cyclic molecule, just one branch or just one halogen, just one thing, you're actually not allowed to say the location. You're not allowed to say one because we all know that that one single thing has to be located on carbon number one. Now, I personally feel like you should be able to say one if you want. There's nothing wrong with being extra thorough, but it turns out that it's actually just straight up wrong. And if you called this molecule one ethyl cyclohexane, it would be wrong, 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 wrong. And that's too bad. You have to leave the one off, but only in situations where there's only one thing attached to the ring. So let's look at another example where we have more than one thing. First, we have to find the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms. It's right here, just like that. Now we have to number that chain of carbon atoms, starting on one of the carbon atoms that holds a substituent or a branch or a halogen. So that means this guy right here could be carbon number one, or this guy right here could be carbon number one. Which one would it be? Like we've got two possible carbon number ones. When you have more than one branch or halogen or whatever on the molecule, one of the ways, um, and you're trying to decide which one should be carbon number one, one of the tools that you can use is the whole alphabetical order thing. The branch or the halogen that would come first when you're alphabetizing it would be the one that gets number one. So in this situation where we have a bromo, and we have a chloro, we're just going to follow the alphabetical order and we're gonna say the bromine is on carbon number one. So once we've decided that bromine is on carbon number one, now we're going to number the rest of the ring. We're either gonna go clockwise or counterclockwise. 
This time it's not completely, you know, arbitrary. We're going to go clockwise or counterclockwise, whichever direction allows us to give the smallest number to the second substituent, in this case, the chlorine. So if we go clockwise around this ring, the chlorine is going to be on carbon number two, and this over here will be carbon number three. But if we numbered it counterclockwise, this would be number one, this would end up being number two, and our chlorine would be on number three. Our goal is to give all of the substituents the smallest possible numbers when we're naming these molecules. So we've decided that it's one bromo and it's two chloro, and we're going to put them in alphabetical order, one bromo, two chloro, and then we're going to follow that up with the name of the, the ring cyclopropane. Now here's something that is kind of frustrating. Over here with this name, I said, it's wrong for you to have the one in front. You're not allowed to say where that, that substituent is located. But over here in this example, because we have two things attached to the ring, we're not allowed to omit the one. We have to include the one. If you left the one off, it would be wrong. And that's super frustrating to me because it just seems kind of inconsistent. So the only time you're allowed to leave the one off is when you only have one substituent and in fact you're required to leave the one off. It's not an option. So we have one more example over here, this last one. We have a five-membered ring, one, two, three, four, five. We have to pick which carbon is gonna be carbon number one. Carbon number one is either gonna be this guy right here with the fluorine or this guy right here with the methyl. We're gonna make our decision alphabetically. So we've got a methyl that starts with an M. We have a fluoro that starts with an F. The fluoro comes first in the alphabet, so this is going to be our carbon number one. Now we have to make the decision to number the rest of the ring, either clockwise or counterclockwise, from carbon number one. If we number clockwise, we'd go this way. If we number counterclockwise, we'd go this way. And we're going to make that decision um, just based on the location of the methyl. If we continue going clockwise, the methyl is going to end up being on carbon number four. If we go counterclockwise, the methyl is going to be on carbon number three. And remember, our goal is to have the smallest set of numbers for everybody. So we want to number this counterclockwise so that our methyl gets the littlest possible number. Now we're going to put this name together. Um, let me add this down here. Our fluoro is on carbon number one. Our methyl is on carbon number three. We're putting those in alphabetical order. One, fluoro, three. I spelled fluoro wrong all over the place. Like, it's U is missing. One fluoro, three methyl. And I've got to make some room here. One fluoro, three methyl, cyclo. This is a five membered ring, so cyclopentane. That's this guy right here. And then, last but not least, I have to fix this. There we go.